Everybody, welcome to the Saturday stream. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. So uh, today, just like the thumbnail and title suggests, it was kind of shocking to me just how fast the institutional domination really came into play as far as Bitcoin. And of course, uh, I'm talking about, it's a great website. It's called buybitcoinworldwide.com forward slash treasuries. Links will be in the description. And I was taking a look at this and just how fast the ETFs or the institutions have actually acquired everything. Actually, let me let me pull up here. And we're going to see that, uh, I mean, the Black Rocks, the Fidelity, the Grayscales, they have a boatload of, of Bitcoin. And when you take a look at the percentage of, of as far as 21 million, it's almost 4%. And it's only been, what, what are we talking about? A couple of weeks, something like that. So just imagine that in two weeks, this is what they've accumulated. Can you imagine what's going to be like in, I don't know, four weeks, six months, 10 years? It just makes me kind of concerned about uh, concentration. Of course, you know, people will say, ah, it's not a big deal because there's, you know, there's so much uh, Bitcoin out there. And of course, we'll never sell. I don't really think that's true. I think uh, at some point uh, along the line, people will sell a little bit and it'll just kind of just get into those hands. But that's either here or there. That's just speculation. I just want to show you just how fast this actually happened. What was crazy to me is that these ETFs actually have almost double than what the countries do. And of course, public companies, private, only 1%, and Bitcoin mining companies, 0.18. And we can actually break this down. We can just see how much the concentration actually is across the board as far as private companies. Now, of course, Michael Saylor, I mean, they're almost at 200,000 uh, Bitcoin, which is roughly the amount that is in the estate of Mt. Gox. So I find it quite interesting about how much they've accumulated over time. And they've been doing it the right way, dollar cost averaging, OTC, using Coindesk, so on and so forth. And of course, Mara, one of the big Bitcoin mining operations, 15,000. And Tesla, who had over 60,000 Bitcoin at one point, trimmed its position, is still in the number three position. I think that's very bullish for us if we think, take a look at it. HUD-A, Coinbase, Galaxy Digital, Mike and his, his crew. And also, I was looking around here, I couldn't believe it, but Voyager Digital has 2,200. So see so yeah, how that works out as time goes on. So that is uh, the, the companies. USA, and of course, USA just filed a addendum. It looks like they're going to sell off some of their Bitcoin, roughly about $130 million worth, which isn't a big deal. But uh, they have roughly uh, the same amount as we took a look at a micro strategy, almost 207000 China, assuming 194000 Ukraine, and so on and so forth. And then this is the interesting one. Mt. Gox still has 200000 I know everybody gives it a bad rap, like Mt. Gox is going to you know, dump on us and it's going to happen. But even so, I don't think people are going to sell 200,000 of Bitcoin right off the block. They know anything about Bitcoin. They probably do if they got in back then, 2013, 2014. They probably know that it's a pretty good idea just to hold until after the halving, but it could be wrong. So that's what we have. And then moving down into the whole point of this, the trusts. Grayscale, unfortunately, is uh, has the lion's share. They'll drop off, but they have almost they have half a million, 512,000. Uh, BlackRock is almost 50, CoinShare is 48, Fidelity 43, and so on and so forth. So I know people will look at this and they'll say, that's a lot I mean, for what it is, and it's kind of worrisome. But I wanted to just talk to you about this. The reason why I bring this up is because out of all the things we just talked about, the number of Bitcoin, it's only 2 million. Now, the total max supply is roughly, well, total max supply is not roughly, total max supply is 21 million straight. It's not scarce. It's finite and roughly 19.7 or so million have already been mined. We won't see the last one mined until uh, 2140. So I think we've got a little bit of time and the value today out of those 2 million Bitcoin is $85 billion. What is that? That is 10% of the total amount. So even though people will say, ah, you know, institutions are really you know, getting into it. It's kind of worrisome. There's still a lot in the hands of the general Joe and Jane, just like you and me. And I think it's uh not too bad and not too much to worry about now. Now, as time moves on, it could be a little bit bad, a little bit worrisome. And if you want to take a look at, you can always check that website. Also, if you go to blackrock.com, you can find out their holdings. This is as of January 25th, and it matches up uh, exactly with the treasury website we just took a look at. Uh, they've got uh, 49,000 of Bitcoin and market value is just under $2 billion total. So again, I think this is an interesting case. And uh, if we're talking about Bitcoin dominance right now, as far as like who holds what, it's the institutions. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. Yes, we are holding more, but uh, institutions are making their way up. 
Also, the economy. I know people are kind of concerned still about this. I, I think you know we hear rumblings of recessions here and there, and of course, yield inversions and such and so forth. And there's something to be said, but there was a report that just came out on Friday, and it looks like uh, things are positive. I, I didn't hear too much about this. I think everybody has been talking about the uh, ETF. So here's something to be a little bit more bullish about. So this was from Blockworks. They said that uh, personal computer consumer expenditures or PCE index date released uh, Friday was in line with analyst expectation. They showed a 0.2% increase in December and a 2.9% high year over year. Numbers are a sign that while inflation is still up, which we can all feel, it is trending lower. And that's what we want to hear. We want, we want to hear that inflation is going down. That means that Jerome Powell and the gang can finally maybe talk about a little bit of pivot action. Of course, once they pivot, we know that there's going to be a recession around the corner, but we get out of the way and that's exactly what we want. Spending last month increased 0.7%. I find this interesting. Spending last month increased almost a point, comfortably exceeding the 0.5% that was expected. Again, I believe this is uh, adjusted for time frame because of course last month was uh, holidays. That was expected. Craig Earlham, senior market analyst at Oanda. He states it's another sign that the U.S. consumer and economy are in a very healthy shape going into the new year. I would just make a little preface, which, which is this. Uh, right now, if you take a look at the amount of debt as far as credit cards, we're at a near all-time high. So we're looking at uh, roughly a trillion dollars in credit card debt. So I know that we've uh, spent a lot. I think a lot of that is on uh, credit cards and debt. So we'll see how that all shakes out as time goes on. And then also a little bit uh, bullish news, uh, Trueflation. You can find them at trueflation.com where they have, they pull in all the on, on, on time data as fast as they possibly can. A lot of different data points. Of course, these are the things that uh, the Fed doesn't use, but they they say that the inflation is actually even lower than what the government's reporting at 1.82%. I know people will say, well, we don't really care about that. Cause that's not what Jerome takes a look at. I'm just taking a look at forward future looking and it looks like uh, inflation may be under control. And we'll see if those rate hikes or those rate cuts come in. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I find that quite bullish. And also, uh, Solana. This was a good one. So there has been a lot of airdrops coming up. And people love airdrops. You know why they love airdrops? Because it's free stuff. The problem with airdrops is that there's a lot of scams out there. So just be careful as much as you possibly can. Get the information from somebody that you trust instead of some guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who says, get this airdrop, connect this to your ledger and see what happens as you get drained. But this one was interesting. When? This was a big airdrop. Uh, this was on Jupiter, the Solana exchange. And if you don't know what when is, I, th I think it's kind of goofy. All this stuff is goofy, to my personal opinion, but people love it. When is a community token based on fractionalized NFT of a poem? Yeah, you read that right. Fractionalized NFT of a poem. Using tech from Oval NFT, Jupiter Exchange, split founder Where Mao's poem, a love letter to when bros into a trillion pieces. Can't make that up. Anyhow, as you may or may not know, according to data reviewed by Coindesk, just under half of the wallets who made WEN's whitelist had claimed their tokens by press time. Each eligible wallet gets the same amount of WEN, which is 643,000 tokens, which if you think about it, it's not bad because it's worth about 70 bucks. That's roughly, well, it's almost one Solana. I think Solana is roughly around 98 bucks right now. So not too bad or a heck of a lot of XRP. So if you haven't done this already, I'll show you how to do it. WEN's creators minted 1 trillion WEN, earmarked 700 billion of it for this three-day airdrop, which is going on right now. And what did that mean for the wallet? The wallets? Well, Phantom Wallet, which I use too. I use Phantom and Titus. They're both hot wallets. Uh, they had a big problem with that. They said, while we did our best to prepare, the WEN airdrop showed we still have more work to do. Solana ecosystem operating at an unprecedented scale in crypto. Proud of helped and some other stuff they say. So essentially what they said is like, look, Solana, the ecosystem could handle it. We couldn't handle it. And we're going to try to do better when we do the Jupiter airdrop. So if you are so inclined to do this, I did this actually last night. It's very simple. You go to the website, jupe.ag, J-U-P.ag, the link's in the description. Don't try to search for it. You'll probably go to a scam website. I put the link in there, not just to waste my time, but so that if you do do it, you go to the right place. 
when you go there, if you've used the Jupiter decentralized exchange at any point in time, you just hook up. Let me show you how this works. I actually recorded it. This is my phone actually. So you just click that button. You say, hey, is this you? Yes, it's me. You connect your phantom wallet, connect. And then you click that button, claim win. And then like, and then you confirm it. And of course there's like no fees because it's Solana. I mean, there's some fee, but it's like ridiculously low. And that's it. So I got 70 bucks for essentially doing nothing. Anyhow, that's what's happening there. And then again, <clears throat> here's the website. This is what it looks like, jupe.ag. And everybody was excited about this. This was, was from Marty Party. He says, Jupiter passes Uniswap in 24-hour volume during when airdrop. The flipping is real. Uniswap, Jupiter. And Marty's right. As far as like 24-hour volume, everybody, there's a lot of people going into that. But just be just be aware that when we take a look at this, this on-chain data, that Marty here is just talking about Jupiter versus Uniswap versus Orca. But if you take a look at uh, Artemis, this is one of my favorite websites because it's free and it's got a lot of good data. If we just take a look at the DEX volumes across the board for all the DEXs that are on Aptos, Near, Solana, Sui, Ethereum, Polygon, so on and so forth, you can see that as of yesterday, Ethereum still had 1.24 billion in volume. That's a boatload. Solana did pretty good at 635, but it's roughly half. Avalanche, way back, Aptos, 3.67, Sui at 70, Polygon or 5. So uh, yes, there was a flipping for the uh, exchanges, but just be aware of the data can be, you know, parsed out any way, that, any way, shape, or form. And that would lead me to our last topic, which is near. Now, you have to understand that on this channel, I am super biased. I usually talk only about the things that I own. So if I talk about it, I probably own it. And on near, I own a boatload of it. So I will probably talk about it a lot. But there's a reason why I like it. <clears throat> First of all, it just had an integration with MetaMask. And if you know, you know, MetaMask only has so many different chains on it. I personally dislike MetaMask. I find it to be cumbersome and uh, a trashy wallet. That's just me and my personal opinion. Uh, you're welcome to sound off in the comment section. But hey, they got a lot of users, so why not? So they did that. Uh, also, I know that Ethereum talked about sharding and a lot of different things, but you know that since September 2022, uh, Near has already done, has already completed their sharding near phase one. They've already had that implemented and that's why they're so fast and so cheap. They actually struck up a deal between them and Polygon to build the, uh, a ZK L2 rollup as they again collaborate together it's because they want to be abstraction. And also another one of my projects I talk about or used to talk about a lot and I don't talk about as much anymore, Sweatcoin, they were able to bring this beauty Sweatcoin's been around since 2018. They brought their 100 million users onto Web3. They didn't skip a beat. There was no downfall. There was no pause of the network. And they brought everybody over during the, during the TGE. And that's when I actually stood up and took, uh, took notice. And if we take a look at uh, daily active addresses, again, in Artemis, it's always near in Solana. It's always like near Solana and BNB. Daily transactions, near Solana and BNB. And then also on fees, as far as like the low cost, it's always like really near in Solana. So there's that piece, but uh, this whole thing about abstraction. I did a interview with Ilya, who's the founder of, uh, of Near, and he kept talking about chain abstraction. So I just wanna lay this out for everybody. Chain abstraction is essentially, if you can think about the days <clears throat> before the internet was smooth, like in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was around, it was a big pain in the A, like uh, to kind of move around and you had to do these different services and dial-ups and it was a big a big hassle and you actually were kind of seeing under the hood. <clears throat> the whole thing with chain abstraction, and we know it sucks. We know that the, that, that the blockchain is kind of cumbersome to use. Wouldn't it be great to use all these different, I mean, cross chains and not have to bridge and, and port things over and just, you know, you could use like a coin from, or a token from Arbitrum and then go all the way over to to Roots or Near or to Solana and just swap things out and not know what the hell is going on in the background. That's essentially what Near is trying to do and kind of be this chain abstraction layer. So we did this interview with Ilya and when you see his background, just know that there's always a there's always this meme I always think about. Because uh, when I was interviewing him, I was like, Ilya, are you one of those guys that just doesn't have furniture and like just works all the time, like the meme? And he's like, no, no, we just moved in this house. So. 
This is a, about an eight-minute interview between me and, me and Ilya, and he's going to talk about what's happening, what's going on, and uh, what's happening in the future. So just take a listen. Uh, this is about eight minutes. We'll come back and do a little Q&A of uh, Nir. So Ilya, welcome to the show for the first time. Yeah, thanks for inviting. Oh, yeah. So here's the thing. I, I know you guys have a lot of lot of happenings going on. I'm an investor, so when I talk about this stuff, of course, I'm severely biased. Everybody should know that by now on this channel. But Ilya, talk to us about what makes Near so great, why the transaction fees are so low, why is it so fast, and of course, what's going on, everything in between. So kind of bring us up to speed with what it is, what's going on, and what's in the future. For sure, yeah. So. On a high level, what we set out to do is not just build another blockchain, it is to truly build a platform that makes Web3 usable, that it onboards next billion users. And to do that, you do need a blockchain. And so Near has a sharded, kind of scalable, low fees uh, blockchain underneath. But there is also a lot of other pieces that coming together. Okay. And, and so a lot of kind of the way we've been framing it is calling it blockchain operating system because it allows to kind of, as a user, to use applications across the whole Web3 without really needing to think about, you know, what blockchain runs under the hood, uh, how to pay for the fees, which developers build it, et cetera. Okay. And so, yeah, what you're looking at right now is near the dork, which runs uh, kind of off uh, blockchain operating system, which you could actually use applications on near, but you can also use applications on Ethereum and on other EVMs and kind of how the chains are coming. So, so kind of at the high level, this is what we call a chain abstraction. We're building kind of the platform where you, as user, you don't need to think about the kind of details and specifics of the blockchain. You don't really need to think about fees, et cetera. It's all kind of taken care of for you. Now, to power that, we have kind of set of components or, you know, a stack of uh, infrastructure that we build. And the first part is near blockchain, uh, which is sharded scalable layer one. Uh, it's built with a uh, few things in mind, how to make it the most user friendly, mm -hmm. the most developer friendly, and the most scalable uh, platform. And from this perspective, the way to build scalable platforms is to follow a very similar pattern to Web2. So generally, the way to scale any system is to add more computers that parallel in parallel process more you know, problems, right? More transactions, more data, store more data, et cetera. And uh, right now we see kind of various uh, ecosystems taking different approaches, right? Cosmos took yep. the approach of having a bunch of different chains and each chain is its own application. And now you as a user need to think about where, where which application it is. Do you have fees there? Like, do you need to bridge? Uh, Ethereum took a roll-up approach, which is, still a parallel processing if you have multiple rollups. But what we see is every rollup has the same thing, right? They're pretty much kind of just mirrors of each other. Right. What Nier, what Nier took is approach where you have kind of underneath the same parallel processing, lots of machine doing different work, accepting different transactions. But as a user, you don't need to see it. You don't actually see that, you know, we have multiple shards that processing things in parallel. Uh, you're just interacting it as if it's a single blockchain. And that is, again, user-friendly, but it also allows to continue growing the capacity of the network. So we can keep adding more shards to the network to the level as the demand grows without users need, and developers in this case to think about kind of capacity of the network. They don't need to care about it. They don't need to worry about it. And actually for developers it, on near. Uh, you can have your application anywhere from, you know, nobody's using it to actually as if you had your own app chain, as if you had your mm -hmm. own Cosmos chain or rollup or subnet or whatever, because the near network can actually scale to that and let you have your full capacity of kind of a single shard. So that's kind of generally how we enable both scalability. And mm -hmm. through scalability, it means we can have lowest fees, right? And so you have a graphic here uh, that shows that we actually have lowest fees right now on average uh, in the market, um, enabling pretty much the most transactions you can do if you're you know, spending 
Yeah. So, so, okay. So that's a lot to break down, but let's just talk about, and you said it right. Everybody wants something that works in the background. They don't have to see, and it is fast and is cheap and it just works. That's really all we care about. And it looks like that's what's happening right here. So you did it. There was a graphic here. This was from, oh, this is uh, January 20th of this year, 2024. How many average transactions can you perform with $10 per chain? Obviously, I just used Ethereum this weekend, as a matter of fact, to do some kind of crazy degen play. And I paid $15.14 or something crazy like that just for one transaction. That's not going to happen. It's not going to, it cannot work and it cannot scale like that. That's why they're doing layer twos. But I found this interesting that if you're taking a look at $10 per chain, you're saying with Avalanche, you can get roughly a dollar because you're looking at $11.99. I think this might be laying into the fact of when they had the problem with their ordinals, which is the same thing that's going on with Bitcoin. Binance Smart Chain, 21, Adam, 56, Solana, 132, and then you guys over here with 849 transactions for $10. Is that pretty much accurate what we're looking at here? Yeah, exactly. This price is actually in dollars uh, at the bottom. Uh, so near is like fra like one cent or even fraction of a cent. Solana is like five, five seven cents. And then, yeah, Avalanche, I mean, 80 cents, but even yeah. like at 40 cents, it's pretty expensive. It is pretty interesting because when we're talking about near, because I'm a big believer in, in sweat coin, and I, I'll be honest with you, uh, Ilya, I did not think you guys were going to pull it off when you guys did the TGE for sweat because you took a product from Web2, which had, which had over 100 million users and brought them all the way onto the chain and you didn't have a hiccup. There was no shutdown and it actually worked. And after that, I became a believer. I'm like, if they can do that, if they can take all those web two people and actually make it work and not shut down, I'm like, there's something to be said. On top of that, when we're talking about these dApps, and you, and you said it, you talked about how it can scale regardless of if you're using a couple people or a lot of people. And here, when we take a look at dApp radar and everybody who's watching this video right now, the link's in the description, there's a project that I keep seeing at the very top, Kai Ching. And then, yeah, so when you're talking about this, you guys really, I mean, I mean actually two of your projects are in the top and, 10 and sweat right? coin, yeah so three three out of top 10 in monthly actives are oh that's right here. play ember you have your your game on here yeah it makes sense yeah. so i always am impressed by also taking a look at the active addresses transactions and fees because we just that's what we talked about there's a great website app.artemis.xyz for its slash chains i'll link that in the description and we're going to see that just taking a look at like january 15th for example the daily active addresses you guys are almost number one and you're right behind Binance Chain. I think you guys flip flop here and there, but you have 1.16 million. Binance Chain has uh, 1.26, Solana is 573, roughly somewhere around there. And then transactions, and here's the thing about, about this one with transactions. Solana here, you're looking at 22 million or so. Now you guys have 2.33 million. Now there'd be, there'd be a discrepancy b b based on if these transactions are voting transactions or they are actually real transactions or are grouped together, regardless, doesn't matter. The thing that I always like to look at is those two metrics and then the fees. And you guys are again on the very low side. So how exactly are you able to do that so well? Is it all the sharding or is it the new technology you guys have coming out? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much sharding, but uh, kind of the way we outline our roadmap uh, back in 2020 has been really a, a set of milestones to kind of get us to like a, an end game of sharding. And so, uh, yeah, right now we are running with four shards, which is, you know, plenty of capacity for this apps. It was plenty of capacity to indeed launch this kind of massive uh, consumer applications that we're having on near. Mm -hmm. But over time, uh, obviously, you know, we want to have billion active users, you know, even daily. And so to, to get there, right, we need to continue scaling the capacity. And so the thing we have coming out um, is what we call phase two. Mm. This is where we're transitioning our validators uh, to actually being able to process more transactions per each individual shard, five to 10 X more improvement performance per shard. And then it allows us to have a lot more shards um kind of right now like we, we just went through four to five but we can actually go uh way beyond that with this new transition and so we have this right now kind of as one of the like milestone major milestones for the near sharding design which again will really make our network more decentralized improve performance 
and uh, also validators. Uh, we're going to have a lot more validators with lower requirements to join the network uh, to participate. So I'm really excited. This will uh, kind of you know continue showcasing and in many ways relate to what uh, people were talking in 2018, 2019 about sharding. Uh, we actually have that all coming now uh, to fruition. Wow, that's crazy. Well, Yulia, I got to tell you, that's a lot of information condensed in a very short amount of time. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to make people's uh, heads explode. So let's just leave it there for now. And what I like to have it is, as you start to upgrade and do these things that you talked about, I'd like to hold your feet to the fire and have you come back on and talk about it, especially with the different upgrades you have. So, how does that sound? That sounds good. Okay. So everybody, uh, you can check out uh, Ilya. I'll leave his uh, X profile in the uh, comment section or in the description, but that's it for today. So Ilya, thanks so much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, great. So thanks, Ilya. We appreciate it. And uh, it's good information. But, uh, you know, again, as great as these projects are, just remember that they're all companies. They're all businesses. And they're all vying for the same thing. So hopefully they can take it to the next level. But again, it's difficult because there's so much competition. And really, I think as time goes on, we're going to see who are the winners and who are the losers. But uh, I do like how near makes things uh, easy, makes things cheap. And they got a lot of people on it. So, you know, that takes care of today for the news and everything else. Thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. If you want to stick